Good morning, my friends. Hey, happy Sabbath. Oh. Today, we've been waiting for the 1st of April for quite a while. And we start our at 5 tonight. So, just a quick announcement. If you're going to be a part of this at 5 o'clock this afternoon, please just meet up with me over here so I can give you the first part of the manual and your instructions for tonight. And that's all I will say about that. So we're going to begin the book of Hebrews. Uh, a deep book, but a great book. And I want to introduce to me why the book of Hebrews means what it means to me. Why I find it it's something beautiful and wonderful. My grandmother, she was a Sicilian. And she had a phrase that she would say all the time and when she was talking about someone in the family. She had like ten brothers and sisters, and they weren't all friendly to each other. And any time in conversation, one of her, my particular great aunts came up to, to conversation. My grandmother would always muddle under her breath, Beto Corsa, Dui Faccia. <laughs> the pretty one, but has two faces. I think that there is a tendency in all of us to be dua facha. Right? We all put our best face forward, wherever we are, wherever we go. And I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing. We all want to present the very best that we have to one another. And even as a church, we want to, to be seen as loving and as kind and as good. And in today's culture, there's more room for that than ever before. Everybody has to be seen as, as uh, unoffensive, as loving, as kind, as good. As, I mean, that's just what the world wants, though they're not that way. And it's true. In John chapter 5, Jesus says, you, you shall be known, right, by your love for one another. And all through the Bible, there's this theme of having kindness and unity and love and goodness towards one another. However, there's another theme in the Bible, and in Romans chapter 7, it is just the highlight. To paraphrase the whole book of Romans 7, Paul says this, that God is constantly stirring up that other face. Because we have a tendency to get locked into the good face, the good side of us, the part that wants to please and love and be good, if there's another tendency to ignore that other face, that other side, and Romans 7 is all about God stirring up that sinful nature using the events of life, using situations so that we can get a glimpse of that other side that we think no one sees, but they do, and especially God. And there is a danger in not seeing this other side that we harbor sometimes, and it's called grieving the Holy Spirit. I mean, the other half of the whole gospel is trying to help us understand and to be aware of what we are, because the only way to be healed of it is to be aware of it. The only way to quit having two faces is to know that you have two faces, right? And so God allows us, it's a gift from him to expose that other side. But sometimes, in like especially if you're me, we get involved in, in image management. I have such a desire that you see me in a certain way that I sometimes fight against that which God is trying to show me through my life experiences. I was talking to Isabel this past week. She called me up for some advice about things, and we got to sharing what it means to be a leader. And I was telling her that, you know, this past year was, of course, with the death of my father, it made it the worst year of my life. But in ministry, in 20 years, this has been the worst year of my life as a pastor. And I'm not saying that as because it's been a rough church. It's just, it's been a very rough year because my other face has been exposed often and many times. There has been some challenging situations in this church, and I was sharing with her, as a leader, I wish I could go back and change things. I wish I could have not said that the way I said it. I wish I would have spent more time with this group or with that family. I wish I would have went and visited them, but I didn't. And that part of ministry and in, in, in part of being a leader, you more than anyone else, you get exposed. Your other face gets exposed because when condemnation comes or criticism comes, that side of you that doesn't want the world to see, there he comes. 
And I told her it was, uh, it's been a bad year, but as far as a leader, it's made me a better pastor having come through it. Because I've seen so many of my weaknesses and so many of my shortcomings and faults. That's why God wants us to see this other side. And this is the beauty of the book of Hebrews. Without the book of Hebrews, I would be a miserable man. Because the book of Hebrews is going to give me a, a, a place to go when Two-Face shows up. When my nice face is not the face that you see sometimes. When my good voice isn't the voice that you hear sometimes. When my good actions are not the actions that you witness sometimes. Thank God for the book of Hebrews. Amen. In the book of Hebrews chapter 1 Paul begins this way. It's different than any other book that he's ever written, and that's why people doubt that sometimes he, some people doubt that he wrote it, because it's so different. But it's different for a reason, because he's in a different realm. He's in a different world when he begins to write Hebrews, a, different, a whole different perspective. He says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. And so now Paul wants you to know in verse 3 that we're not just talking about his son like a, a regular human being or even a divine being, but he describes him this way, who being the brightness of his glory. The word being in Greek is hon. It, it's a word that's only used to express the eternal, to express deity. The, the expression of deity and the brightness, the outshining of his glory. God's glory is all that he is. The sum total of God is called his glory, his character, his actions, his power, right? So Jesus is the eternal expression of the brightness of the glory of God. The express image, the word express means exact, carbon copy, not an iota's difference. Of his image and his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, Upholding all things, if you, if you research this out, it's, it's, it's the word they use is all systems. All systems. That is all the microbiology within me, all the, all the biology without us, all of the things that hold the world together, all the laws of nature that we know, all the rules that govern the universe, the universe that we can see and the universe that we cannot see. By him and his power, he upholds all these things which he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This is no doubt deity being reintroduced to deity. God being introduced to God, like he would say in another place, God said to God, the Lord said to my Lord, he's trying to tell you that this son that came and visited you from, from the heavens, he was God. But it's interesting, verse 2 says he was the heir of all things. How could he be the heir if he already possessed it? And this is what's interesting. How could he be the heir if he already possessed it? And some people that try to say that Christ is not uh, on equality with God. He is not God. There's no divinity. He's just a created being right here. They try to use this, but this idea, Paul's already told us who he is. How can he be the heir? Whew. This is how he's the heir in Philippians Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. Paul says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. This is how he's the heir of all things. He gave everything up. Amen. Before, it was called, it's called the incarnation. When he came to this earth, he surrendered everything that was his, all that he owned, all that he'd done. He returned it back to the Father and said, I've got to make a trip. I've got to become a man. And he comes to this earth, yes, as divine, but also as a man. But he surrenders all that he owns, all that he's done. And right for a time in his life, that part of who he was was gone from his mind. He's the heir of all things because he's returning back to heaven. This is the homecoming of the Prince of Heaven. This is him receiving back which was already his. This is God reinstating to him the titles of the Prince, the title of King, the title of Lord, the title of the creator, he's given it all back. He's receiving all of that. 
Hebrews chapter 1 is the homecoming of the prince of princes. It is the homecoming of the heir. And that is good news for us as the chapter begins to unfold. And it says that he was after he purged and after he cleansed us that he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Now, if you remember from the book of Daniel, there's only one other place where God is described as being seated. In Daniel chapter 7, the Ancient of Days, remember he was seated and the court was seated and then they brought the Son of Man. He comes, there's a picture Daniel leaves, the Son of Man kind of standing in front of the Father that who has been seated in the judgment. Well, here now Paul is telling us that that Son that came before the Ancient of Days has now taken his seat beside his Father. He's picking up the story where Calvary leaves off. And not until this seating takes place can mankind be purged from their sins. Very important. Now that all power has been returned to him, now the process of salvation can begin. Now here is the difference. You hear me talking a lot about emergent church theology. You hear me talking a lot about the, the theology out there in the Baptist world or the evangelical world. Here is the difference between the gospel before 1844 and the gospel after. The gospel before 1844 is focused on the earth. It's focused on a Christ, a Jesus of the earth. It's focused on the atonement that made the forgiveness of sins possible. But post-1844, as we have spoken about, which the whole Daniel, book of Daniel has pointed us to, and the book of Hebrews now is, is just really spotlight in that time period. After that time of 1844, there is a new focus that takes into account the purging of our sins when the Heavenly Father seats the Son. And the purging of the sins has to take place once and only after the Son is seated. And most of the rest of the world are focused on the life of Christ on the earth. They're focused on Calvary. They're focused on the cross. They're focused on his parables and his teachings. And those are good and true and should never be lost sight of. But our gospel not only takes that earthly life of Christ, but it points us to the heavenly idea of Christ because it's in the heavenly where the sins are purged because of the world, if you know, they believe that once Christ came to Calvary and the cross, it was all finished, all done, all completed. Nothing more after the end of that. Just believe. But the book of Hebrews say, no, that's the beginning of salvation. The atonement made efficacious every sin that would ever be committed, but those sins would not be forgiven until he ascends to heaven, seats by the Father, and then we approach that throne, and then he can purge me Amen. and cleanse me. In fact, that's what 1 Corinthians talks about. 1 Corinthians talks about that he went and he justified us, he washed us, he purged us, that word for purged is katharizomai, and it means to cleanse. It means to be brought to the labor. And you can't be brought to the labor until, of course, the atonement was made. But we're washed and we're purged once he seats, is seated in the sanctuary in heaven. The false gospel will always only focus on an earthly Jesus. It will never focus on a Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary because that is where you must engage the living Christ. It's easy to focus on a Christ that was crucified. It's easy to focus on a Christ that did parables and talked about love and goodness and kindness and all those things are true. But it's a different thing to focus on a Christ in the heavenly sanctuary where before you can be purged, there has to be this concept of repentance and coming to him as we're going to see how the story unfolds. Because it's interesting that in Hebrews, I love how Paul says he he was the express image of his glory, of his power, of his person. But what does he do by himself? By himself. Not with the aid of God, not with the aid of the Holy Spirit, but by himself he purged my sin. He shared in God's power and God's glory and God's image, but he brought me to the labor by himself. And it's just this picture of Jesus being seated and being able to now stand, sit beside the Father and able to represent each and every one of us, which is a wonderful thing. So whenever my other face shows up, I have been promised that that can be purged, that that can be cleansed because God, who emptied himself of God and came to the earth and then ascended and was recalled God again, renamed God again. 
Because he ascended and sat down by the Father, he can whisper in the Father's ear, I've been there, I understand, I know what Damon's going through, I know about that other face that he's got, I've seen it in so many people, I understand his weaknesses, his proclivities, his problems, but I see his heart, I understand what he's saying, Lord, he's okay, his faith is genuine. It's that idea of them two sitting together representing me. If I didn't have an understanding of Hebrews, understanding of what we believe in the sanctuary in heaven, where Jesus is right now continually presenting before the Father me and my sins and my repentance, it would be a difficult world. It would be a very heartbreaking world. And because he is there representing us, Paul says this in Hebrews 4, 1, verse 4 through 5, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, for to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now this is something you have to know about Paul, especially in the book of Hebrews. He uses the Psalms everywhere. The book is filled full of the Psalms. And the Psalms he quotes are shorthand. He'll just quote a portion of the Psalm. That's his shorthand version because you should be chimed in to the Psalm that he's talking about. And that whole Psalm is part of the context of Hebrews especially in chapter 1. He's quoting Psalm chapter 2, verse 7 through 12. And let's go there, we'll get the whole picture. Psalm, Psalm chapter 2, verse 7 through 12. And this is where Paul is quoting to help us to understand what he's talking about, this excellent name that he's achieved, and what that excellent name means to Damon's need. Right? I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. And this is one of the famous psalms right here. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Do you see what Paul is saying? Blessed are those who trust in the son. Kiss the son, lest he be angry at you. Kiss the Son and put your trust in Him in that heavenly sanctuary when you bring your sins before Him because He will forgive you. Amen. And in the Bible, there's only two places in the New Testament where Jesus gets a kiss. Do you remember them? Right? It's deliberately written this way. Kiss the Son. It was a big Hebrew idea. When you see the Messiah kissing because that's where salvation is. That's where, where trust can be placed. The story is Mary. When she's weeping, what does it mean to kiss the sun? What does it mean to put your trust in him? You remember when she lets her hair down? She knows what she is. She knows she's a sinful mess. She knows all the things that he has forgiven her. She lets her hair down in that ancient symbol that when a woman did, it was an exposure of who she was. It was telling the world, I've got my hair all up in a nice bun with a hat on and, and a little suit and tie. I am telling you what I am. It was a confession of her sin. It was a weeping and her tears were flowing down her face onto the feet of Jesus. As she was kissing his feet, that is one of the beautiful places of what it means to kiss the son. It means to confess. It means to come before him with humility and brokenness. It means Mary was saying, I understand what my other face looks like. And she came in there with everyone else that day in the room that all had the good face on. And she had the good face on, but then she wanted to let everyone know that he has saved me from my other face. Amen. And then there was the other kiss that Jesus got. The kiss of Judas, who was mimicking Mary. He had on his other face. He had the good face on. He's going to come kiss the Messiah. He's going to try to do what Mary did, but he does not have the repentance. He doesn't have the brokenness. He doesn't lay his money sack at Jesus' feet like she lays her wealth and income at the feet of Christ, saying, all that I have is yours. I am broken. I am saved by you. I love you. Here, take everything that I am. She pours it out on his feet. 
But Judas doesn't do that. He kisses the Son of Man, but there's no repentance. There's no giving over of himself. There's no honesty. And he betrays him with a kiss. The kiss of faith becomes the great reward of those that come to him who sits with the Father. Hebrews 1, verse 8 through 9. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. This is actually what's going on when you come before the Father with your sins, when you have that brokenness, that contrition like Mary demonstrated, or even like the tax collector. When you recognize you have that other side of you that you don't like and you feel gross about it. You feel evil, you feel sinful, you know, you just, like, you just don't even want to face nobody after you've demonstrated that. But when you do and you come before Him and you approach the Son that sits by the Father and you kiss the Son, then there is this idea of a scepter being held out to you, a scepter of righteousness. It's interesting that another one of the few places where scepters are spoken about that helps us to understand where Paul is coming from. Do you remember where else scepters were used that were held out to someone that was under a death penalty? That someone that dared to enter into the court of the king without an invitation? Esther, the book of Esther, the whole nation is, is under a death penalty. Esther chapter 5. You didn't dare come into the king unannounced. That was also a death penalty. But it tells you in Esther chapter 5, verse 1 through 3. Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes. And she stood in the inner court of the king's palace. Across from the king's house, while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house, facing the entrance of the house, so it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. And then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter. It is the most beautiful picture of what Paul is talking about. My royal robes that I put on. She don't come in there dressed like the common person who she is. She puts on her robes, the robes of righteousness, the robes of Christ. She comes donned in the apparel of our Savior. And she walks in and the king takes one look at this woman who is under a death penalty just by walking into that place. And he holds out the scepter to her, the scepter of righteousness, and says there will be no death in this court today. Amen. So I can come before him when I mess up. I can come before him when you see the worst of me. I can come before him in honesty like Mary and just let my hair down because the king will always extend that righteous scepter to me if I am clothed in his son's righteousness. Isn't this a whole of Romans chapter 3 and Romans chapter 4? That we are saved by the righteousness of another man? robed in the righteousness of another man, by faith in his righteousness, I can come in my sinful state, in my sinful condition, confessing that sinfulness. And I have assurance that it's not over, the ball game's not finished. I have assurance that God will cleanse me, that he will purge me anew and afresh. It's my great hope. And this is what I have, the axe that I have to grind against so many other religious persuasions that do not understand the book of Hebrews or the book of Daniel or Revelation chapter 14 that speaks specifically of our heavenly high priest entering into the holy place and then later the most holy place. If you never look upward, you are never challenged. You are never challenged to see yourself as you are and then reach out and touch that golden scepter. These new religious paradigms teach you to look at all the parables. Look at Jesus on the earth. Look at his sacrifice for your sins. Yes, the atonement. But Hebrews challenges me to take that sin to where it can be purged and cleansed. And that demands that I know that I have sin. And not just see it in the general sense like, yeah, we're all sinful. We all have a sinful nature. Yeah, I get that. And you do. And I understand that particular things that we do to one another. 
particular things that we tend to hide behind, especially even righteous ideas. Maybe you are truly right about what you said. Maybe you are right about what this person did to you. Maybe that thing that they want to do is absolutely wrong and you stood up and you rallied against it. You gossiped about him. You spoke evil about it. And in that way, because you're right and you may really be right, we can hide that other face really well behind righteousness. Well, that person, did you hear what they said? Did you hear that? Oh, that's why I can't stand that girl. I can't stand that woman. And we hide that other face in righteousness, which is the worst thing you can do. What you should do in that moment, which I am trying to learn to do in my own self, is not to hide that other face, but to go to God and say, Lord, I don't know what's going on with her. she got issues, I know that. But Lord, my reaction, the things I've said, the things that I've done, God, that face has come up and, and help me and forgive me and change me and transform me. That's always the gospel. That's the part of the gospel that the other churches don't want to talk about. Why is it that I love the world more than Christ? Why is it that I give to the world and don't give to this church? Why is it I can spend my time in the world but not time here? Why is it at 5 o'clock this afternoon the church will only have 20 people in it? Take those moments instead of getting mad at the word that calls it out and say, God, why is that? Because you have another face, Damon Sneed. And if I can be honest like Mary and let my hair down before God and say, Lord, purge me and cleanse me. He'll hold out that scepter of righteousness, cover me. And begin this process of transforming and changing me. And this is why Paul says in verse 6, but when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Worship him is what it means to kiss the sun, right? To kiss the sun. There's only a few people in the Bible that we get this idea of what it means to worship him. Mary was one of them. The word worship is prosukanuo, and it means to bow oneself down in humility. You see that in the tax collector, remember? It says that he bowed himself down. He, he wouldn't even look up, and he beat his chest. That's to worship. Paul is saying, worship him. Kiss the son. Because of what he'll do for you. If you're honest with him. And that is always the big trick. Kiss the son, Damon Sneed, when you are like Mary. Recognizing your sin. Kiss the son, Damon Sneed, when you have been a Judas How blasphemous it is then when we see people kissing the Pope's ring. Because it's a direct, it's a direct idea out of Psalm, one of Psalm chapter two. You only kiss one, the son. That's not the son. You're not to kiss that, so that's not the son. And we as Adventists get it. We understand why they do that because of the claim that, well, this is God. And we understand how blasphemous that is. But there was a song that came out some years ago. It was kind of a goofy little song. and It was called, I Kiss Myself. So we may not be kissing the Pope's hand. But we sometimes <laughs> love to kiss ourselves, right? And I think that there's a danger within the church today that we kiss ourselves. There's a movement within Adventism that is a strange doctrine. It's a different gospel. It's not the one that we knew. It's 178 years old. It's a new one. It's the one that's teaching you to, to just, I mean, I get it. You've got to love yourself and respect yourself. And I don't mean that we need to go around beating ourselves up all day long. But it's a religion. It's a gospel. It's an understanding that only lifts up what's good. Only to talk about the positive and the wonderful. And when you do that, there's truth in that. But if that's all that you do, and you never focus upward where you can kiss the sun, then you're being taught to only kiss yourself, only to make yourself feel good, only to please yourself, only to leave there feeling good. And that is extremely problematic.
Ellen White one time wrote, at the end of time into the church would come a specious gospel. Right before the coming of Christ, a specious gospel would come into the church. I said, what is specious? So I looked up the word specious, and it means superficially plausible, but actually wrong. It's true on a superficial level, but actually it's wrong. Past truth without present truth is specious. The cross without the sanctuary is specious. Right? The atonement without our heavenly high priest imputing righteousness to us is specious. And there's an entire segment of the church that is just gobbling it up and it's superficially true. Without the rest of it, it is a specious movement. Because it never tells you to focus up here. It never causes you to look through those 12 books of Daniel to the appointed time when the heavenly high priest enters into this special work. And in that special work, he is there to hold out the scepter of righteousness to the repenting, believing soul. And the true work of the Holy Spirit is not to make us some kind of uh, mystic, of some kind of infusion of righteousness where we just become holy, but it is actually to show your unholiness. And it uses the situations of life. It doesn't lie to you. It tells you when you're mad at your mother-in-law, yeah, your mother-in-law might be out there. (laughs) But why am I upset at my mother-in-law? And if we can get the hang of this, if we can get the hang of this, we will become like Christ. That's the paradox. The more that I see myself unlike him, the more I become like him. And that is the specious element of today's gospel out there. It refuses to do that work. And Hebrew warns us. Chapter 1 warns us if we do not do that work. Boy, here we get into the good stuff now. Verse 11. And Paul says, they will perish. But you remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up and they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will not fail. Again, Paul is quoting shorthand Psalm 102, verse 26. Those that kiss themselves, those who refuse to kiss the Son, those that refuse to look to the sanctuary where where God Himself did a work for us, they're going to fade. They're going to fall away. There's truth, there's righteousness, there's life only in one. And let's go to Psalm 102 to get the real meaning of where He's trying to take us. Listen to this. This is, this is some awesome stuff here. Psalm 102. Whew. You ready for this? Psalm 102. Let's just read the quote from Paul so you know where we are. Verse 26. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will change them. So he's quoting that, but if you go back and you read the first one through ten verses, which I'm not going to do, but it is clearly penitential. Paul is clearly drawing the mind of the man that before he can reach out and want to reach out to that scepter of righteousness, before he'll ever want to, to ascend to where the throne of mercy is, he's got to go through this penitential part of his life. He says in verse 1, hear, hear my prayer, O Lord, and let, me cry, let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Verse 3, for my days are consumed like smoke. My bones are born, bo- burned up. Verse 4, my heart is stricken and withered. I'm like grass. I, I'm groaning. Verse 5, verse 8, I, my enemies are reproach all day long. Verse 9, I eat ashes like bread. I'm mingled with my drink like water. Verse 10, because of your indignation and your wrath. My days are like a shadow that lengthens and I wither away like grass. It is a confession of the condition of the human being. It is a confession of our sinful nature that is like grass. It's like wither away. We're enemies. We're broken. It's what Paul would say in Romans chapter 7 and chapter 8. O wretched man that I am, who shall save me from this body of death? This is what David is saying. And then Paul adds that phrase right from Psalms that you will fold them up. There's only one place in the New Testament 
where you read that something was folded up. What was folded up in the New Testament? His burial clothes. John chapter 20. I've heard some, some interesting takes on that. But it wasn't until I read Psalm that I understood what Jesus was saying. In John chapter 20, he's departing. He says, I got to go to a place where you can't go. The last scene they're going to have is Calvary. He's going to come back to them. <clears throat> but before he comes back to them, he does something. He folds up his grave clothes. It's just like Jesus would have taken a Bible. Those folded clothes was like him laying the Bible open to Psalm chapter 102, verse 19. For he looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven the Lord viewed the earth. <laughs> He's telling them that I'm going to the sanctuary in heaven. That's exactly the moment they saw that. They would have went right to Psalm 102. So keep this state of confession. Keep this state of repentance. Keep coming to me because I'm going to the Father. I'm going to sit right beside him. I'm going to offer you righteousness. And you keep bringing your repentant, confessed life to me every time you mess up. The disciples would have immediately known what he was talking about the moment they saw that. It is the promise of what Paul is reminding them in verse 1 through 3 of Hebrews. That this being called God, who was the image of God, who was the power of God, who was the glory of God, came to this earth and made it possible that we can purge you of your sins. So when those disciples messed up in their life, and they were going to mess up bad, weren't they? They were going to have lives of stumbling. Paul and the other disciples, would, Paul and Peter, would end up in a huge knockdown drag out. Another disciple would leave and then later come back. Their lives were not perfect. They were filled full of contention. Peter didn't want to have nothing to do with the Gentiles. Would get up and leave the room if one walked in, if another Jew was in there. But Jesus is reminding them, and Paul is telling them, He is ascended to the heavens, there to give you righteousness if you'll come before Him. And if you'll do that, there's a promise that Hebrews ends with. Verse 13 and 14, their last two verses. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? It's interesting to take on the word the heir who has inherited everything is looking down at those that will inherit salvation and to help them along the way he has sent to them these ministering spirits. If you look up to the heavens where your righteousness is, where your forgiveness is, where your hope is, if you look up, God will send you something down. And that are these ministering spirits. They have come to minister to us. Listen to this one little quote as we start to wrap it up. We need to understand better that we do the mission of the angels. We need to understand better than we do the mission of the angels. It would be well to remember that every true child of God has the cooperation of heavenly beings. Invisible armies of light and power attend the meek and lowly ones who believe and claim the promises of God. Cherubim and seraphim and angels that excel in strength stand at God's right hand, all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation. Amen. We've got help down here. So when I stand up at a business meeting, I'm like, Lord, be with me. Help me. Give me wisdom. Give me discernment, God. Those angels are promised because I'm not looking to my own strength. I'm not looking to my own help. I am looking upward to the heavenly sanctuary and the ministering angel stands right beside me and says, Ooh, leave that alone. <laughs> Don't go there. Shh. When someone texts me something, I get on my phone. I'm like, oh, no way. And right before I hit in, the ministering spirit says, Damon, Don't do that. Remember what happened the last time you did that? <laughs> it created a furor. And in your ignorance, you've lost people. God has promised to help me if I keep looking upward. 
If I keep my eyes focused on that heavenly sanctuary where my righteousness is, where my help is, where my heavenly high priest is, if I keep coming to him like Mary in the honesty of my heart, if I keep coming to him like David in the Psalms in brokenness of my bones, if I just keep doing that, he'll keep sending the ministering angels to help me, to provide for me help and strength and wisdom and direction, protection. They will bring to me conviction and Help me to overcome temptation and help me to have contemplation on the one who is above, who will constantly be whispering in my ear. And not to mention, he don't even talk about it till later, the power of the Holy Spirit to come in. We got all kinds of help. Amen. So there's so much more to the gospel than the Jesus that walked on the earth. Or we're told, by the way, to spend a thoughtful hour there. But then get your minds up there where the help is, because that's where the living Christ is. That's what Christ did for us. And it's necessary to know that for salvation. But the living Christ exists there. And that is all that Paul in chapter one is trying to say. Get your mind up there. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Let's have prayer. Father in heaven, what wonderful advice that comes out of the pages of this holy word that challenges us to kiss the son, to kiss his feet like Mary, to never kiss him as Judas did, to constantly look to you for our strength and for our help. Help us to let our hair down, Lord, in your presence. Let us touch that scepter of righteousness that comes from Christ alone. Bless us and help us in this world, Lord, as we try to live together in sinful natures and broken bodies, differing opinions and struggles among each other. Help us in this church body to live as brothers and sisters, even when we disagree, even when we hurt one another. Help us to look away from what is done to us and look to our Heavenly Father. God bless this church, I pray. Keep us from falling. And keep our families strong, keep our marriages strong. And just bless and be with us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.